Hello and welcome to another interview uh, here at Open Source Workplace. Uh, my name is Steve Todd, I'm the founder of Open Source Workplace and today I'm very happy to have Adriana Girdler who is the President and Chief Efficiency Officer at Cornerstone Dynamics. Adriana, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you so That's much. A mouthful. For That's a mouthful to get through. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> But no, I, I, I'm a, an admirer of yours. I've been uh, uh, watching your YouTube uh, channel, your LinkedIn posts, and uh, you post some great stuff. So I'm very happy to have Thank you me. here today. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So Chief Efficiency Officer, what, what is that? Uh, people ask me that all the time, right? So it's a, definitely a pun, uh, first of all, on CEO, right? Because I go, I'm a CEO, Chief Efficiency Officer. But really um, what it is, is I help uh, people do what they do better. So it's really looking at what people do existingly uh, on a professional front and helping them do that better. And we really focus in, on the internal ways of working versus their product or service because they're really good at that. But how they do their product and service, I promise you, needs a lot of help. Interesting. Interesting. So you started though as a mechanical engineer. How did you go from that to what you do today? Um, it's, a, it's actually, it's an excellent story. <laughs> Yeah, so it's I have a very interesting background and I'm really I'm glad I used to I, I my first degree was history. I graduated with a history degree and I got into sales and marketing and then I decided to go into mechanical engineering. So I went back to school, which was an excellent decision. It, it really it was awesome. I'm so glad I did that. Um, but how I got into Cornerstone Dynamics is I've always, since I was 18 and when I first started a university, is um, I got into time management and I got into the Franklin Planner System and they really believed in goal setting and stuff like that. And I swear to God, way back when I said, I'm going to own my own company. I don't know how, I don't know what, I just always knew it was going to be there. And so as time progressed, you go through the channels, you don't know what you want. I did sales, I went back to school, did engineering, the whole nine yards. And in 2000, I actually revisited my goals and values. And I said, I'm going to have my own consulting company by, by, by 2010 was my, my goal that I put out there. Didn't know how, didn't do what. Um, ultimately, what happened is I actually started my own consulting company in 2008 during the major recession. And how all that unfolded um, was I was at a course at York University for my master's, my, my master black belt in Lean Six Sigma. And um, people knew that I was doing that at the pharmaceutical company that I was working for uh, from an engineering perspective. And they were like, can you help us? Can you help us? And at that point in time, I um, was working part-time because I had two kids. And I really wanted to balance that uh, work-life balance. And I said, yeah, yeah, on my days off, I'll, I'll do it. And then literally in four months, I was literally working 24 seven. Uh, I had to make the decision, like, what do you want to do? Do you want to start your own company? Because obviously there's a need, <laughs> you know, you're busy, you're going crazy. Um, or do you want to stay in the pharmaceutical company and climb that corporate ladder? And I took the leap of faith and I went past the fear right? Went past the fear. And I said, you know what, if I'm going to do it, now is the time because I can always get a job, right? But if I'm going to do it now, it's the time. So I actually jumped in the deep end with two feet and I have been nonstop ever since. So there's my story. Wow, that's <laughs> and ironically, great. always knew I wanted to do that. Just yeah. No, that it is. So, I mean, you said you want to, you evaluated your goals and so on and so forth. I mean, what motivated you to actually sit down and do that? Was it something that uh, a life incident or how did, how did that, how'd you come to do that? Uh, yeah. Okay. So how, um, how vulnerable do I want to get? Um, so I, I guess my childhood was, um, very traumatic, not personally for me, but, um, I have a brother who, uh, probably bipolar schizophrenic, um, has a lot of issues. He's older than I am, uh, created a lot of havoc in our household. And it was just chaos, like constant chaos. And, and my parents are the opposite of being organized. So I think I just knew at a very, no, like honestly, at a very, very young age, um, organization, just really having clarity, knowing what you want, because I didn't live in that. And I just knew, I, I guess what I always say to my own kids is, there's two types of people, people who learn from other people and people who have to make the mistakes in order to learn. I'm a person who learns from other people. So I'm like, shit, I don't want that. 
that is not what I want in my life. That is not who I am. So I, whatever I could, I just gravitated and tried to get, oh my God, that's what I, so that's why at a young age, I was like, that doesn't work. Uh, what else can I do? So that's how no, it's so interesting. Thank you for sharing. So yeah. you, you within an organization, what was the fear you had to get over? Um, well, there was, a, there was a couple of fears. Um, the first fear was actually believing in myself and knowing that I could do it. And uh, I, I have actually, there was a pivotal moment in time when I realized, and that was part and parcel of me leaving um, the pharmaceutical company, is there was a big dog and pony show. Um, you know, the global heads were coming through. I revamped to uh, packaging lines from an efficiency standpoint because I did, you know, mass master, black belt, six sigma, all that lovely production related work. And um, they, you know, and we did the traditional stuff. Okay, let's stand in front of a board and show our lovely sheets. And I just kind of, I said, no, that's not what we do. I, so I turned the guy around and we looked at the line and we were talking and he was like, oh my gosh, you know more than our efficiency gurus that we hire to direct all the other, you know, because I came from automotive prior to going in pharmaceutical and automotive is like the birthplace of all this efficiency stuff. So it just, what I realized is at that time, I, I, I didn't think I, you know, cause you know, when you're in your hole, like, you know, you're in your lane and you know, you're, you're strapped down and, Oh, can I do that? Can I, but when he was like, Oh my God, you know, more than our efficiency gurus, that alone was like, Oh my gosh, I do know my stuff. And I, and I am really good. So guess what? I'm taking the leap of faith. So that, that was probably the biggest fear is the belief, uh, really believing in myself and then having the confidence to go with it. And how did you to get over that? I mean, so obviously you have that fear, you take the step. Was there a moment where you went through and you went, I'm over that fear, things are moving forward and I feel good? Um, yeah, so there's, there's um, it, because this is a really good question for people out there listening, whoever is listening mm -hmm. to this. So. And, and I do not, I don't want to code it to saying, this is what you have to do to do it. Because getting over your fear, there's, there's layers to it, right? It depends on what the fear is, how long it's been around, the, the whole nine yards. Um, you know, having confidence in yourself it, it, and, and knowing that you can do it and the belief is really a big part to getting over the fear and just kind of walking through those doors. Um, I probably... You know, throughout my life, I've, I've gone and walked through the, you know, past the threshold of fear and realized it didn't hurt me. And, and so when I finally got to this point in time, um, when I said, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it now. I've already been through a couple of thresholds of fear, which were probably had a greater fear on a personal note that mm -hmm. I was fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you don't know that until you go through it. It's all psychological. It's all psychological. So when I went through that fear, that threshold of fear, um, it was more of, oh my goodness, I'm on my own. Um, I'm totally responsible for myself. Holy smokes. But listen, I have an amazing background. I have sales background first. So I, you know what I mean? Like it, it helped out tremendously. I wasn't sitting down waiting people to call me. It's like, shit, I got to go out there. <laughs> no, <laughs> I I that's, cold calls. <laughs> and that's, that's great perspective, right? We always have fear, but we actually really undervalue our own skills, right? And our own experiences and how we can rely on that, right? Um, so that's really good context. So um, your customers, your clients, wh when do they come to you and what typical problems are they trying to solve? Um, it's, it's interesting because there are common threads no matter the industry, because I work in all different types of industries. That's one of the great things of doing the work that I do, internal work. Helping with the process and improving it, becoming more efficient, it's all the same, no matter what industry you're in. What makes companies unique and different and industries unique and different is the product or service they provide. I'm not touching that. I'm touching how you do your product and service. So there's this commonality across, across the board. So based on that commonality, um, usually they, their problem is, it's usually high level. We've been dealing with this. We've tried to fix it before. It just didn't work. Um, you know, we've tried adding this software or this bandaid. They don't call it that, but that's what it is. This bandaid and it's just not working. And as a result, uh, you know, we just, we've given up. We don't know where to go anymore. And so 
going back to my engineering background, you know, it's, it's, it's not about giving up, it's breaking everything down and going to the root. And a lot, and that, so that's really what I help organizations do. You have this problem, but that's really not your problem. Let's go to the root and fix that. And so a lot of what I do is this customized work because we're figuring out um, what is it that we need to fix. And usually it's an efficiency problem. We got to bring in project management. We got to retrain people. So it's this kind of, you know, that's usually the issue is we have an efficiency. They don't know to call it an efficiency problem, but it's usually an efficiency problem. Let's get yeah, back and, at it. And obviously whenever they bring you in, is there, how do you measure the success of your engagement with, with your clients? How, do, or how does your client measure that? That's a, that's a great question because there is hard measurements and there's soft measurements. And I talk to my clients about both because everybody just wants to measure the hard measurements, right? Show me the money. Well, depending on what we're fixing, there may not be money to save depending on what we're fixing. Now there may be, because we may fix something efficiently and it may be related to production line and therefore we're not spending as much time and we don't have overtime anymore. So yeah, those are really good hardcore savings. But when you start going into industries like in sales and marketing and finance, where you have a process that's really broken and you fix it and you streamline it, but everybody now doesn't have that headache anymore and they're happier and they have a little more time to take on more projects because they're not doing it. That's a hard thing to quantify. So you kind of have to take a look at the culture. So, I mean, like, obviously there's some traditional things that you do, like you pick time and metrics and, and, you know, surveys and things of that nature. But, um, that, you know, those are probably the biggest measure, measurements physically that we would do. But the other one um, that a lot of people forget is I spend a lot of time with executive teams because they make or break things. So I'm constantly checking in with them because they can take something really successful and kill it without them realizing that they're doing it. And, and do you see whenever, you're, obviously, the, the various clients you engage with, various locations around the world, mm -hmm. do you see differences in geography in their approach or their openness to work with you? Uh, yes, actually. <laughs> How do I say this? Um, but you know what? It's, it's culture. It's, it's all about culture. So every culture is unique and different. And countries do have cultures associated with it. Um, you know, a really good example would be American culture versus Canadian culture. I'm a Canadian, we're a Canadian company. Um, I do notice this. I notice this uh, with my Canadian clients who have a, a U.S. executive come in to a role. I notice this when I go to my U.S. clients. Um, not to say that Canada doesn't have competition. Canada does have competition. But, uh, you know, I guess the... Um, you know, the old adage that we're really polite is also true in business, right? Like, you know, we're really like, don't, don't get me wrong. It isn't as if we don't have politics and there's not people who are trying to climb that. I just find it's very evident in the States. I walk in, it's like, Oh God. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> like It's evident. <laughs> there's a game to be played and you better play it. Whereas in Canada, uh, for example, and even some European uh, countries, yeah, there's a game to play, but we're really trying to do the best job for the organization and the company. And yeah, there's politics and games, but um, it's 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 all about getting ahead in the States, but that's why they're successful. Right, right. That's and, why yeah. they're successful. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's why yeah. they're at the top. Yeah, and, and given, so. given what you've just said, then does an efficiency officer have to be an internal or external? Does it have to be an external person? <laughs> Um, n no, you, there are lots of organizations that have, um, lean Six Sigma departments, efficiency departments within their organization, kind of like a project management office, right? They'll have PMOs and set, set that up. Um, it depends on the scale. I, I, I would say here is the problem when it comes to efficiency work, like, or anything you can study it all you want, but it's all about the practicality. How practical are you with it? It's the practicality that gives you the life lessons that the schooling will never. It's kind of like your degree. You got a degree, yay. Now throw it out the window because all your life experience is going to be worth a lot more now. Right? But it got you through the door, right? right? right so right. it's the exact same thing with efficiency work. So, you know, um, it is helpful to have internal efficiency people because it is a culture shift. It's a paradigm shift. It's, it's a whole new way of thinking and working. So setting that up and integrating it with your strategy 
extremely critical if you want to go down that path. Now, if you don't, or you just don't have the funds or the energy and resources, having an external person come in is great, particularly at high level, high complex things, because I'm neutral. I call myself Switzerland. I go in and I'm really there looking for the betterment of what they're trying to do based on the goals and objectives and the scope that, that, that we've, we've figured out. So it really depends upon the organization. I, I do feel sometimes an external, depending on the integrity of the person, um, if they're there to ensure that they get the work done that they've agreed to from a scope perspective, um, it may be slightly better because they're not there to play games. Right. right? They're right. not there to play games. And, and in efficiency work, you can't, there's politics has to go out the door because you don't have time for it. There's so much to fix. <laughs> and I also I have to imagine that executives would rather have an external person telling them or challenging them rather than an internal individual. Is that fair? <laughs> Yeah, you, you know what, I, I think it's the problem of corporations, period, because when I worked for the pharmaceutical company and the VP, who I knew really, really well, pulled me in and did an exit interview, like, Adriana, you know, I'm not surprised you're leaving because, you know, you, I can see you doing your own thing. And I said to him, I said, you realize one day you'll hire me back and you'll pay me lots of money to tell you stuff that I told you for free <laughs> when I worked for you. And he laughed because it's so true, because there's so much politics and we sometimes don't appreciate the people who work for us. So the external person, even though they say the exact same thing, they're outside. And for some reason we put more credence and effort around it. And so on the, how, do, how do managers then better uh, use the resources that they have whenever they're within an organization? How, I mean, how, how could your organization have used you differently or better? Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> oh, intensely so. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, well, I, I, I think there's, there's, there's a process related answer and there's um, a personality related answer to it. The process related answer is really simple. A lot of organizations don't understand the skills that they need, don't understand what skill set people have. They don't understand the expertise level that they have. They don't document things properly, et cetera. And in the my world of process improvement, the whole goal is provide value to your customer, but also is to be nimble. And if something should happen, it doesn't matter if you're doing it or if I'm doing it, uh, you should be able to walk in my shoes and be able to finish off what I'm doing, ideally very quickly. Uh, but that doesn't happen. And a big thing that I try to bring into organizations is skills matrix. So we, you know, we figure out what are their main skills, what are the levels, and that's a very process oriented thing that's very helpful. Now, the personality part comes in and the culture part comes in that in order to make that work, you got to sustain it. So you have to get rid, and I have one client right now that we're talking of doing that with a whole bunch of coordinators cross departmentally, and they are up in arms. They do not want to have it. No, because you're going to know where skill level is at. It's fear. They're so fearful of going, you know, oh my goodness, we're not, I'm not looking to see where you're at and, and do that. I'm just wanting to know that when we get in a busy time and I have you in a project, which is more important to my strategy and organization, who can I pull on to take over that day-to-day -day work and have you on something more important? People don't see that or understand that. And it's either because they've been burned, right? Where they've lost mm -hmm. a job or whatever. Um, or organizations don't have the time in order to really think like that. But that's where they have to go if we're going to be more effective and efficient. And I'm telling you with artificial intelligence, I would want to be as nimble and flexible and know as much as I can as possible because you wait the next 25 years, what's going to happen in corporate worlds? A lot of things can and will be taken over with artificial intelligence. So how are you going to distinguish yourself? Right, right. Totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. Um, so one final question I like to ask everybody. Um, so if you had to give guidance and advice on a way that an individual or a company could actually maximize workplace productivity and employee experience, what would that be? It's a very good question. Um, I, I, what I'm going to say is for individuals on their own and for organizations. And, and that is, I think organizations really, and they don't do this well because I see a lot of them and you've probably seen them too, really understand what are they about and what is their vision. But now I'm not talking a traditional business vision. I'm, I'm talking about an inspirational vision, like JFK saying his vision was to land a man on the moon and return him safely. Well, guess what? There was a space war going on. And, you know, how do you get people who've never done something like that before to start coming up with ideas in order to do it? That's really inspirational. That helps people become productive. That connects people. 
being product productive is not about having just having the right efficiencies in place and the right processes. It's everyone working together and feeling that they're coming towards a common goal. And I think a lot of times I see a lack of that. And so when I go back to fix problems, I usually, it usually goes back to, well, what's your vision? Like, why do people get up and, and want to do this stuff and do the extra mile? Like, why is that? And so that's what I find is missing a lot, big time. And they don't live it. They don't use it as a tool. And the same thing for individuals. And in, every individual should have a personal vision statement. And this is what they should be living by and making decisions with. And if that's the case, people would be really aligned to their purpose and their truth of what they want to do. And take accountability, which is really important. no. That's that, that's great. That's great. I, I I mean I'm I'm a big believer in the vision statement, setting goals, and uh, then the to do list to achieve those goals. It's 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 so critical, so important. Absolutely. Important. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. is there anything else, Adriana, that you want to cover before we uh, we f we finish up here? Um, no, it, it was it was a pleasure. I I mean I have tons of resource information. I mean I don't know if you're sharing that. Obviously I websites and stuff like that so you know of we'll, we'll certainly share we'll certainly share yeah, all that youtube Absolutely. channels all that stuff so yep. check it out because you know i i um i love what i do and i'm connected to it and i love sharing what i've learned over the 20 plus years of doing it um so yeah it's uh no. as i say learn from others don't make your own mistakes <laughs> and, and i can attest every video you do there's something to learn and something everyone can take away so thank you for everything that you do i really appreciate it even oh, though, you know, thank so, you yeah. thank no, 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 you thank you thank you so much for your time today thank you All right. have a great day